Genesis chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 11. We'll begin first in Genesis chapter 4 with verse number 1. And if you get a little chilly on that side, you can close the door. It gets a little warm when you start worshiping. Or I guess instead of closing the door, you can just start worshiping and warm up if you want. (laughs) Genesis chapter 4, verse number 1. Now, Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me, from the ground. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaks. I look at that last phrase that we just read in Hebrews chapter 11, and that text from Genesis 4.10. The Lord says, The voice of your brother's blood cries out to the ground from the ground to me. And Hebrews 11.4 says, And by faith he being dead still speaks. We think of life and prayer very differently than what it looks like in this passage of Scripture. When I think of the praying saints that prayed over this holler, When I think of and I hear the stories of the men of God that began this work and them going up into the mountains and you could hear them crying out to God into the wee hours of the morning as their prayers would echo off of the mountains. We think, Lord, what it would be like to hear those saints pray today. But God 
still hears it. Prayer is eternal. Faith is eternal. The people of God don't die. The people of God don't stop praying. You can put them in a coffin, dig six feet of dirt, put that dirt on top of them, but it doesn't stop the praying. You can be like Cain and slay Abel and think that you stopped his worship and that you stopped his prayer. But it doesn't stop the prayers of the saints. We find out when we look over into Revelation that there's some martyrs and the devil tried to stop them. And there's more martyrs today for the cause of Christ than there's ever been. Martyrs in communist countries and martyrs in in, in Muslim countries and even martyrs in America. There there are martyrs, but but, but just because you put a bullet into them, it doesn't stop their praying. Because in Revelation it tells us the martyrs are gathered up at a prayer meeting in heaven and they joined their prayers together and they're praying and they're interceding and they're joining their prayers together. They didn't quit praying just because they left this earth but they're praying over now right in the throne room and they're joining their prayers together and God help us. But in Hebrews chapter 12 it talks about, Paul says after he tells us about all this faith that has went before us, the faith of Abel, the faith of Enoch, the faith of Noah, the faith of Abraham then he says seeing how we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses do you understand that the reason that we're going to see the greatest move of God in this hour is because our prayers are joining with prayers that are going on in heaven and that there's saints of old that there's prayers from Abel to Enoch to Noah to Abraham to brother Granville Easter to brother Mays to sister Zelda that are joined up in heaven and they're praying and they're saying God I've got grandchildren down there God I've got sons and daughters I've got nieces and nephews and they're hooked on drugs and I didn't pray and I didn't bleed and I didn't give my life to the cause of the gospel to see it in this way and they're joining their prayers with ours hallelujah that's why Jesus said when you pray Pray that as it is in heaven. Folks, we need our prayer meetings to join with their prayer meetings. But sometimes our prayer meetings are different here. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was the night before His crucifixion. And he had a whole lot of folks there when he was feeding. 5,000, 7,000. A whole lot of folks came out for the feeding. Then he had good groups that would gather around as he taught. Soldiers would say, man, we've never heard anybody teach like this one. What a teacher Jesus was. Folks pressing in on him. Pulling at his garment to get miracles. But while there's thousands that come for receiving, the crowd thins out with its prayer meeting. Not even the twelve. But only three. Come to an all night prayer meeting. Peter, James, and John. And these are the good ones that persevere and they show up for prayer meeting. But they sleep through it. It's the hour Jesus is calling to prayer. The church is asleep.
It's the hour where Jesus is saying, pray that you enter not into temptation. Peter, you're going to go through some stuff. You're going to need to pray and get yourself ready. He told Peter, Satan has desired you to sift you as wheat. You better pray and get ready for what's coming up. You see, some of the stuff that we go through, we would go through with victory if we prayed. But instead of responding to the call to prayer, and I just, I just think that Jesus knew that they were going to be asleep every time. But He brought them into the garden so that they would learn the importance of prayer. He called them to prayer and they slept through it. How many seasons of our life has God called us deeper? Has God put a yearning in our heart? Has He been pulling us to be people of prayer? And, and, and we just keep hitting the we keep, keep hitting the snooze button and saying, Lord, just 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 let me nap a little longer, God. Just let me put it off just a little bit more, God. But but now is the time that we as the church, if we're gonna see our kids saved, we better get in the altars and pray. If we're gonna see our family won, if we're gonna see addiction broken, then we better go to the altar and say, God, I'm not waiting. I'm hungry now. Lord, would you send it now? I'm not asking for next year. But God, would you send it on my family? Would you send it on my home? Would you send it in my community? God, now I'm going to you in prayer. The Lord said to Cain, Your brother's blood is crying. (laughs) There is something about prayer, something about faith, something about worship. That is so eternal. That the blood can leave your body, but it still cries. The Lord says that back in Genesis 4. Your brother's blood is crying right now to me. Huh. Let's pray. Even though Abel was gone from this world, he's still praying. He's still crying out to God. But it's not just shortly after his death in Genesis 4. But you get all the way over into the New Testament. And the writer of the Hebrews says, and his blood still Still. Come on. <laughs> Thousands of years later, Abel is still praying. You can't kill it. Amen. You can't stop it. Faith is... You, you can't defeat it. That's why they, 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 they said as they were martyring Christians in the first century that the blood of the saints is the seed of the earth. It's planted in the ground, but it keeps growing up again. You might try to destroy it, but every time you beat it down, it grows back up in multiplied life because it still speaks. Oh yes. Oh, yes. You see it in the Old Testament and... Elisha, who had that great anointing from Elijah, did twice as many miracles as Elijah the prophet. Received that mantle from heaven and went out and did the miracles that Elijah had done. Well, he was one miracle short. 
of doubling Elijah's miracles. Just one short. And he died. I bet when he died, he thought, man, I almost, I almost had that double portion. I asked God for a double portion and I almost received it. One miracle short. I bet as he's on his deathbed, he's just a little bit frustrated that he didn't quite break through. But I don't know if he understood that there's an anointing that gets on the people of God. There's an anointing of faith that it doesn't matter if the breath has gone out of it. The breath might have gone out of it and you might throw it in a borrowed tomb. You might bury it. You might roll a stone in front of it. But Paul said, if that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it'll quicken your mortal bodies. And so there Elisha was, maybe a little disappointed and nothing left of him but his bones. He'd been dead for a long time. He'd been in a tomb for a long time and they threw a murdered man in there on top of his bones and lo and behold as soon as that dead body hit those anointed bones he came back up out of the grave and that dead man walked out raised from the dead and there he got a miracle. He got that last miracle not while he was alive but because the bones of the man of God, the bones of the saints still carry the anointing of the almighty God. Hallelujah. God, I wonder, what kind of faith, what kind of anointing, oh, in the cloud of witnesses is surrounding us. Oh, God. I read about it. Brother Shane preached last Sunday night, Psalms 85, 6, and said, will you not revive us again? And I read about some of these revivals. Some of them, just a little over a generation ago, you can watch them on YouTube. William Branham. Somebody comes up to him. He doesn't know what's wrong with them. The Lord tells him, you see goiters disappear. Shrink up right in front of your eyes. Come on. That brother had an anointing from God. Anointings from God. Brother, East step. Baptizing. And a surge of water pulls them out into the river 30 foot deep. He couldn't swim. The person he was baptizing couldn't swim. They walked back. Come on. They walk all the way on top of the water. But it's like the Lord put some kind of plank underneath it. He said it's tight. It didn't even get wet. 30 foot deep water. God did these great miracles. We are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. And they haven't quit praying. They haven't lost their burden for their family. They haven't lost their burden. They're praying, but they're praying from the grave here and from heaven on the other side. And they're praying and they're saying, God, would you do it? Would you send it down? Would you send it on my children? Would you send it on my grandchildren? Would you send it on my nieces, on my nephew? God, would you let my anointing, would you let my bones be carried into this move of God? Oh, J- 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 Joseph, he understood it in such a way. He was, you know, Joseph, he was carried into Egypt, ruler of Egypt. But on his deathbed, he said, you know what? It's going to be a while. But God is going to visit you again. And God's going to bring you up out of this place. 
He's going to bring our family out of Egypt. He's going to take us into our promised land. And he said, when God visits, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to take my bones. Take my bones with you. I don't want them to stay here in Egypt. I want my bones to go where God's moving. And they, when they left Egypt, after God took them out on that Passover night, one thing that they didn't do, they didn't leave Joseph's bones in Egypt, but they went and got Joseph's bones. And they honored the bones of the man of God and took him to the promised land and the glory. And he got to go and go through the Red Sea and go into Jericho and be where the glory was. Hallelujah. God help us. Their voice. It's crying out here on earth. But it's also crying out in the cloud of witnesses. In the heavens. Some of you got grandmas up in heaven. You wonder why you couldn't kick and scream and fight God. You got a mama or grandma. And they didn't quit praying for you after they got buried in the ground. No, they're right in front of the throne now. And they're saying, God, don't let them go. You know, God, I cried out to you. And their prayers are an incense and a memorial before God. And they're crying out and saying, God, I, I call to heaven to account for my son and for my daughter. I call heaven to record the promises of God and the peace of God and the, and the promises of God for my children. Hmm. Abel, thousands of years, still cries out. You get a different level of prayer life when you get to go to the other side. You might fall asleep in Gethsemane down here because Jesus said, the Spirit's willing Oh, that flesh. That flesh is weak. That spirit's willing. You get a touch from God on the altar. Sister Adam, you feel like you could just dance, 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 couldn't you? But sometimes that flesh can't keep up with where the spirit's at. You might have to dance a little bit with that cane. You didn't have to dance with that cane a few years ago. The spirit is willing. But see, they went to the other side. They're not carrying that weak baggage of the flesh. <laughs> you got some mamas and grandmamas that are praying night and day, day and night. They're calling out. And they're right in front of the throne of God. And they're saying, God, send it again. God, revive them again. God, send it to the school. God, send it to America. God, don't let our sacrifice be in vain. But send it, oh Lord. Let us join our prayers down here with the prayers in heaven. And say, God, send it again. As it is. In heaven, what would it look like when heaven, like it is there, happens here? That's how we. That's how we got to pray. That's how bold our faith's got to be. As it is there, hmm. there's no hatred there. Hmm. There's no school shootings there. There's no racism there. There's no addiction there. There's healing there. Hallelujah. There's a tree and it's got leaves on it that bring you healing to the nations. God, as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. There was a church in Calhoun, Georgia about 20 years ago. Started experiencing revival. And they began to pray for an open heaven. God, give an open heaven as it is in heaven. Let it be here in this church. 
They had people that started pulling into the church parking lot. Not during service time, but during the week. Come knock on the doors. Find somebody in the office and say, I was driving by here and I fell under conviction. Help me get right with God. Because there was an open heaven. Well, they weren't satisfied with that. So they said, God, let the open heaven expand. Yeah. There was a lady that would take a walk on the street by the church. She was backslid away from God. And she noticed that when she would get to where the church was at, she'd fall under conviction. So she would not walk so far in that direction. Well, the church kept praying. And the border of where she could go kept getting further and further out until she couldn't leave her front yard. (laughs) Then it got worse. She couldn't get off of her front porch. And the church kept praying, God, as it is in heaven, let there be an open heaven here. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't get out of her house. Then she couldn't leave her bedroom. It wasn't long after she couldn't leave her bedroom. She's like, I'm just going to get right with God. I can't fight it. I can't resist it anymore. God, help us to pray as it is in heaven until it fills this holler, until it fills every part of this community, until it moves up and down these mountains, until addicts come and lay their drugs on the altar and say, God, I'm ready. I need you. I'm under conviction. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord's hand is moving here. I had a I had a couple people like, we heard y'all were in revival at Little Leatherwood. And I I thought, well, I think we're pursuing revival, but I didn't I don't know I would have said we're in it, in it yet. But the blessing, Jesus said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. Mm -hmm. The blessing is not the filling. Because the filling happens when there's hunger. The blessing is when God sends the hunger. So that we're not content just having a service. But we're hungry. Yeah. Oh, yes. We're not content. With a baptistry that doesn't have somebody baptized in it this week. We're not content. We got family members that are on their way to hell, need Jesus. We're not content with addiction. In our community. It's not in heaven. Shouldn't be here. We need to pray until it isn't here. As it is in heaven. I heard one one, one last story I'll tell you and then close. Colin, come on to the music. Danville Church God experienced revival about about 20 years ago. They had one service where they had 80-something people baptized. On the way to this revival service, the Lord tells this lady, He says, go get a towel. She's like, what, Lord? He said, do you believe I'll save your daughter? And she said, yeah, Lord, I believe. He said, then go get a towel. Her daughter was out on drugs, partying. So she obeys the Lord, goes and gets a towel. They're at baptism in service that night. Her daughter's out partying and because she's been doing drugs, she's having somebody drive her home. 
And she says to the person driving her home, you know what, I think my mom's probably over here at this church. Just drop me off there and I'll just get a ride home with her the rest of the way. She goes in. They're baptizing people while she, when she gets in. Conviction falls on her. She runs up to the altar. Gets saved. Gets in line to be baptized. And her mama had to tell. Ready for her. Come on. God. God help us. As it is. As it is. In heaven. In this community, Lord. Abel's blood still crying out. There's grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles still crying out to God. Praying over this. Let's join our prayers. Our faith. And if we're not hungry enough, let's ask God to make us hungry. Hungry so that we're not satisfied until we're filled with all the goodness of heaven. We're not satisfied dabbling in sin and coming to church. But we lay our junk on the altar. We put a sacrifice there. And maybe it's not sin, but we say, you know what, God? I want you more than I want this. I'm laying it on the altar. Maybe it's a spiritual Skittles that's kept me from being hungry. Maybe I'm laying social media, TV, laying it on the altar. Because I want my voice to be in harmony with Abel's cry. I want my prayers to echo Elisha's bones. I want my faith to be with the cloud of witnesses. Saying, God, do it again. Don't let prayer die in my generation for my family. Amen. Amen. I heard my mom and my grandma pray. God, let me have a prayer life so my children hear me pray. I grew up hearing them pray in the mountains and the echoes of their cries to God. God, let me, let me pray so that the children getting on school buses hear somebody praying over them. you want to be more hungry for God hungry for his revival in this community in your life I'm going to ask just come and gather around this altar let's cry out to him now